I am the Reverend Jennifer Butler, and I'm the CEO of Faith and Public Life. Um, how many of y'all know Faith and Public Life out there? Oh, good, <laughs> good number. We're a network of 50,000 uh, religious communities and clergy and lay leaders around the country working for social justice. And we have offices in four states, in Florida, Ohio, um, Georgia, North Carolina, and maybe coming to your state soon. Um, I'm also a pastor, I'm a mom, and I just wrote this book, Who Stole My Bible? Reclaiming Scripture as a Handbook for Resisting Tyranny. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a bit about that today, and um, I use uh, something called Midrash in, in uh, my book, and uh, I thought we might try some of that today. I'd love to hear from a, a few of you as to what drew you into this workshop on reclaiming faith or reclaiming scripture for liberation. Does anyone uh, want to share kind of what brought them in? Maybe it was a well-positioned tent on the, the campgrounds, <laughs> or maybe there's another reason you came in. <laughs> in what sense? The title says it all? Yeah. So how are others doing that? That's right. Yeah. So um, scripture has been co-opted by literalists and uh, it's meant to liberate. And so how are others doing that and how can we do that as well? Thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to share? I always love to hear where people are coming from, what they want to take away. Oh, right. So that's right. What, remind me your name. I thought that was you. It has been a long time. So we first met um, when uh, Sister Simone Campbell of Nuns on the Bus fame was going through North Carolina. Woo! <laughs> and they were reclaiming their Catholicism for social justice at a time when it was being hijacked by others. And so we were, I was um, helping Sister Simone at that time. Awesome. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about my journey and why I wrote this book. Um, I grew up in the South, in the Bible Belt, and uh, it was the 80s, and um, I was really committed to my faith. I really wanted to follow this Jesus, and I was terrified of nuclear Armageddon. I was a rather serious kid, <laughs> uh, but it was the height of the nuclear arms race, right? And so I would lie awake every night. My mom would come in and check on me and be like, Jen, you're still awake. What's wrong? I'm worried about nuclear war. <laughs> Uh, my poor mom. Um, and I attended a huge Methodist church on Peachtree Street, 8,000 members. We went to church three times a week. And um, I was really drawn to the passages in the scriptures where Jesus said, I have come to bring news, good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Proclaim the year of God's favor. But I didn't hear that message being preached in my church. Um, you know, there were good people. There were nice people. But I happen to know I was one of the first generations of kids being um, allowed to attend an integrated public school in Atlanta. We decided Brown v. Board of Education in the 1950s. It wasn't for 20 years until Atlanta started integrating its public schools. And meanwhile, some of the friends and family member um, uh, that, that we knew were withdrawing from public schools because of school integration. And so here I am in a church at a time when we're not loving our neighbor, when we're not treating everybody in, in the image of God and, and in dignity. And I'm not hearing that preached from the, from the pulpit. So like a lot of you here, I think this is what brings a lot of us to Wild Goose. I went on a journey to find that Jesus who said, I have come to bring good news to the poor. And it took me a hell of a long time to find that Jesus, to find the language for it. How many of you were told about the four spiritual laws and told to witness to other people, those little Bible tracts, you know, the four spiritual laws? I was trying to be a good Christian in college, and I was trying to memorize those four spiritual laws, and they just would not stick in my head. And I think the reason that they wouldn't stick, of course, is because they didn't make sense. Um, they just didn't make sense at all. And so I had to go on a journey to find the language that would speak to the God and to the Jesus that I knew. So 
I just came from a week of caring for a friend who I met in seminary. Luckily, I got to go to seminary and try to sort some of these things out, but a lot of us don't get the chance to do that. Or we go to seminary and actually they kind of barred liberation and feminist theology from my seminary for a while. It was, we had to really fight to get it. But I just came from a week of caring uh, from a friend that I met in seminary who's dying. Her name is Jen. And I first met Jen at a time when um, I was being stalked on campus by a future minister, you know, of the church. And I had to move dorms because of sexual violence and uh, to protect myself. Um, I came, um, I was, so I was talking to Jen about this story. She can barely talk at this point. And I was telling her how I came out of the bathroom one night and I saw smoke coming from her dorm room. So I peered in to make sure the person inside was okay, and she was making hot whiskey sours in her little kettle on her dorm room floor, and the little smoke was wafting out the doorway. So I told her when I meet her in heaven, I'll know who she is because she'll be making whiskey sours for me. But Jen, um, we used to joke, she came from the land of milk and honey. She came from Minnesota, and she came from a progressive Presbyterian church, and she taught me to reclaim my faith. I went through such a period of disillusionment because of what I was seeing in the church, because of sexism, that I nearly left. And it was Jen who time and time again brought me back and said, Jen, look who you are. Look inside for what you truly believe and claim that faith. Don't let others define it for you. Don't let them take it from you. And so I sort of dedicate this time this morning to my friend Jen, who helped me find my voice. Uh, many years later, I was still struggling with that. Jen had sent me on my way, and I was working in the field of international human rights. I was um, working for the Presbyterian Church at the UN, and I was really debating, do I really stay in the church, and do I claim this faith, or is it so patriarchal and so hypocritical that I can't stick with it? I was really grappling with that, and it was a real bummer because here I would trained for ministry, but I was thinking about leaving. And we were doing an international human rights um, event at the United Nations, and um, the, the interfaith women had reserved a space in the chapel across from the UN uh, to do some events on religion and gender justice. We ceded our event to Muslim women. So here we are in this chapel to the UN. There's only a, an altar uh, in the front of the chapel. It's a big granite slab, the biggest granite slab I've ever seen. It can't be moved. So these Muslim women um, were talking, were concerned about religious violence. The Taliban was um, resurging in Afghanistan, and um, they wanted to talk about that. And so we gave them our space to talk about that. It was a packed room. They're sitting around. We, we stationed them around this communion table. It was the only place we could make a panelist table. And to this day, it still reminds me of the kind of communion that we ought to be having in terms of building community. It's become a symbol for me. But they're sitting there, and um, there was a commotion at the door midway through their presentation. I looked over near the door, and it was the Saudi Arabian ambassadors and their security detail. They had come in to intimidate the women. The woman in the middle faltered and looked nervous. She was being intimidated, and the crowd suddenly stood on its feet, applauded the woman for five minutes, which also had the effect of blocking the door so the security detail could not get in the room. The woman was able to continue. She regained her confidence. And after that moment, I realized if Muslim women experiencing what they are experiencing can face down that violence and reclaim their faith for justice in the world, then I sure as hell can too. As a white, northern, privileged woman, I sure as hell too can, can, can reclaim my voice and uh, reclaim the faith that had propelled me thus far. Um, and I can do it for two reasons. One, because people around the world are hungry for that kind of spirituality and that kind of faith, and um, oppressive faith has been holding them back and been used to oppress women. But I can do it too because... It's, it's my faith that is giving me the courage uh, to continue. I shouldn't let other people hijack and define that faith for me. Flash forward to 2017, and Donald Trump is in the White House, 
And um, one of you mentioned earlier that it's fundamentalism that you know, had been hijacking our scripture. Today, of course, it is white Christian nationalism hijacking, hijacking our faith. And so it's really critical that we get out there and redefine what faith is in the public square. But it's also critical, I'm realizing more and more, that we ground ourselves in our sacred texts because in our sacred texts are the spiritual disciplines and strategies that we need in order to resist authoritarianism and white Christian nationalism. So 2017, they announced that they're going to kill the Affordable Care Act. They're going to gut Obamacare. And it's going to cut 20 million people off health care. And so I found myself um, issuing a national emergency call to clergy. We gathered 300 clergy uh, on the Capitol grounds and we marched to Paul Ryan's office. This bill was being introduced uh, in the House, and Paul Ryan, a Catholic congressman who runs on the bus, also took on, was in charge of moving that bill forward. And so we decided to go mano a mano with our faith and talk to him about faith. We had 300 lay leaders and clergy gather on the National Mall, and they each brought their sacred texts, whatever tradition they were from, and inside, they talked health care stories of people who would die who were, who, if, they were, if this bill went through, if this legislation went through. We stormed Paul Ryan's offices. We crowded the hallways in front of his office. We sang, we prayed, we preached. He was in those offices, and so we were shouting through his door. He wouldn't meet with us, so we just shouted through the door at him. And we stacked sacred texts this high in front of his door with his health care stories. After that moment, I was walking through the hallway, and I saw a woman who looked dazed. And I was like, you know, we'd been on our feet for hours, and I thought, you know, maybe she needs something to eat or couldn't find her way out. I said, hey, are you okay? She looked at me with tears in her eyes and was like, I feel like I'm finding my voice. I'm able to speak to my faith for the first time in my life. She was a little bit older than me, and I feel like so many of us are in that situation. So I set out to write this book, Who Stole My Bible? Um, in part, at first I was going to make it like a book of strategies and tactics. You know, I'm a community organizer. My faith has always expressed itself in that way. And I started to pull it together. And um, I had read a book uh, called On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder. Did anybody read that book? It's like 20 Rules for Resisting Authoritarianism. He's a Holocaust uh, historian, historian and expert on fascism. So I was going to write, I'm like, I'm going to do that book. It's a short little book. I'm going to write these rules, and it's going to be real fast. I'm going to take a really brief sabbatical from organizing. I'm going to crank it out. Well, that wasn't going so well. I had a few people read a few first drafts, and uh, how many of y'all are writers out there? <laughs> that was a painful moment. Uh, they were like, mm, mm, maybe not. And, uh, you know, I was having a, sort of a, a personal moment there. It was terrible. And so I called a Jewish colleague of mine. And I started talking to her about what you know, really um, energized me about this potential book I was cranking out. And I was like, you know, our scripture has been hijacked, but the whole Bible is a handbook for resisting tyranny. And she was like, that's it, Jen, that's your title. And you get so lit up when you talk about scripture. So what I do in this is I go through the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And I reimagine the scriptures. I use Midrash which is simply the, pro the, the sort of process that the Jewish community uses of reading the text and dialoguing with the characters, having a conversation with the characters, using your imagination to think through the text and apply it to your life and to the times that you're living in. And as I, as I did that process, I realized that the text was speaking to me on so many different levels levels. It was speaking to me in terms of how can I communicate with others more effectively and help them understand how authoritarianism is not the will of God and white supremacy is not the will of God. It seems so obvious, right? But how do I communicate more effectively? But it was much deeper than that. I was realizing I would be out at a protest or a rally or about to do civil disobedience, and I would find 
verses of scripture echoing in my soul and in my mind, trying to tell me something, trying to ground me, trying to help me in the same ways that stacking those Bibles in front of Paul Ryan's door helped me really ground in the moment and claim the vision that God has given us. Um, and so um, I think, you know, what I, what I might do is just read um, to you uh, one of the midrashes that I do in this book. Um, and then um, if you'd like, we could even try, you know, a midrash ourselves. I see some nods here. Um, and so, um, frankly, um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to go Genesis to Revelation. Once I got done with being overwhelmed with the idea of, like, rewriting the Bible and going through the Bible as a handbook and saying, no, this is how it should be read, I was like, what the heck am I going to do with Genesis? Like, Exodus, obvious. The prophets, obvious. I'd even, like, started to study Revelation, and I realized, oh, yeah, it's a critique of the Roman Empire. You know, and so I went back and looked at that again. Um, but Genesis, what am I going to do with Genesis? So I delved in to some of the uh, rabbinic literature and exegetical work on Genesis. And I was really amazed at what I found. So the creation story, and I was taught this in seminary, but they didn't get to the important implications of it, that Genesis um, is not a science book, like we know that, right? They're not trying to tell us how God created the world. It is a moral indictment of the, the creation stories of that day in the Middle East. It is a moral indictment. They're saying, no, 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 the world wasn't created by gods who were warring with one another so that, and, and human beings weren't um, created to be slaves of gods. No, human beings were created for something else. So um, what I did was a midrash, and um, I'll just uh, read it to you and see what you think. Um, I think as I read this... Um, uh, I think toward the end, I'll, you know, invite you to, to sort of think, you know, how did that story struck you? I want to hear some of your feedback on it. So in this um, piece that I wrote as well, I want to say that um, as I read what the creation story was, you know, that was truly just a moral indictment of what people thought at that time. Again, that human beings were created to be slaves of the God. And if you think of it, if, if human being, if, if God is a tyrant, and if God enslaves human beings, then slavery is okay, right? So however you view God or envision God or your cosmology is how you're going to shape your world and how you're going to model your world. So I started, for my, my midrash, I started to think, what would it have been like in that time to hear this story for the very first time? If you live in a world where gods are tyrants enslaving human beings, what would it be like to hear this story? In the beginning, I heard the old man say, as he warmed himself in front of the fire, the men were telling stories to wind down from the day. Mother warned me, hurry home, there is a curfew. Father used to begin many of his bedtime stories with those words. I stopped in my tracks, thinking about the last time I had seen him. He had held my shoulders and looked into my eyes. I'll be back soon, I promise. But he did not return from battle that day, and many of the fathers are missing. And now foreign soldiers occupy our town. One is living in our home, and mother is forced to feed him with the little we have. Soon, I will no doubt be drafted to build temples or fight wars. My neighbors, who once called out in greeting as I passed, now keep their eyes down. The embers popped and settled. It startled me back to myself. I studied the men's faces. Some of them I've seen. Some of them are nomads, including the storyteller, and they're in town to trade. The older of the nomads smiled gently and continued, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ah, oh, this story, I know this story. I used to ask Father to tell me scary stories at night by the warmth of the fire. I loved the one about Marduk, who created the earth and human beings from the slain body of his main foe, Tiamat. I didn't mind feeling fearful as long as I was snuggled next to father. 
Now that he's gone, though, this story gives me nightmares. I know that Marduk will soon burst out of the sky in his flaming chariot, pulled by his team, killer, crusher, unyielder, and fleet. And then from the blood and bones of Tiamat, he will create the heavens and the earth, and he will create human beings to be his slaves. The gods, their armies, the blood, and my missing father are all too real to me now. No one ever questions Marduk's rule. It is said that he can hear everything. A chill went down my spine and I turned to leave, but paused as the man said, and God saw that it was good. Good? There's nothing good in the tale that my father used to tell me. Only violence. I listened longer. This new God creates with just a word. No blood, no war. I sat on a rock nearby. The man continued, his eyes sparkling with the shimmering light of the torches around him. God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God saw it was good. The first time the nomad spoke it, the second time he sang it in a deep and joyful voice. The listeners grew still. They stared into the fire, dreaming. I knew that look on their faces. I see it in my mother's eyes whenever she touches the necklace father gave her before he left for battle. That look is love. That look is hope. Humans created in God's likeness, not from the bones and blood of dead monsters of war, and not to serve the gods. It was very good. The man looked at me with gentle eyes. No one had done that in a very long time. Suddenly, I heard the clank of metal. The soldiers were on patrol. I was doing nothing wrong, but still I thought, this story is treason. I could not put words to it, but I knew somehow this story was dangerous to those who occupied the town. I ran home. Mother was angry that I was late. No, she was fearful. I just looked into her eyes, and for the first time since the war, I melted in her arms, and we held each other tight. So that's the story of Genesis rewritten. <laughs> Any thoughts? Anything strike you? Is that new to you in terms of the story and uh, what, what the Genesis story was meant to represent? I see a few nods. Any thoughts come up for anyone? Well, I'll take a sip of water. <laughs> so from that, I take the spiritual discipline of imaging people in the human of God I, in the image of God, imaging people in the human, in the image of God, and um, excuse me, I tell the story of um, when uh, when Trump passed his zero tolerance policy and was separating children from their families at the the border. Um, we went down. We took a women's delegation down to the border, and there. Um, we met Sister Norma Pimentel of Catholic Charities, who has a respite center. And above her door mantle, she has uh, the saying, restoring human dignity, restoring human dignity. And what they do every day is bring families who've just been left out of, been let out of detention centers over from the bus station where they've been dropped off by ICE officials. They bring them into her rep rep respite center they um, give them hospitality. They take care of their medical needs. They give them food. They give them showers. They help them get directions for where they're going next. And one day we were watching as the families came over. And um, there was a long line of about 100 people. And there was a little boy on the shoulders of his father. And he was slumped over. And I was just so worried about that boy. As a mom, he reminded me of my own son. And I kept my eye on him the entire time. And as the line of people got close to the respite center, the volunteers are standing out front, and they start to applaud and cheer and clap and welcome them like heroes into the center. As soon as they did that, 
that boy went from slumped over, looking like he was about to pass out, to straightening up like a plant that had just been watered and smiling brilliantly. And then when I looked up and saw that motto, restoring human dignity, I was like, this is it. This is imaging people, uh, re-imaging them, giving them back their dignity. And um, we do that when we pound, say her name, Brianna Taylor, when we say his name, we're giving people back the image of God and human dignity, encountering the kind of president uh, that we had under Trump and the kind of white nationalism that's resurging at this moment. Let me check the time. Yeah, so we have time to do some midrash. That's good. Okay. So let's do a little midrash. Um, and uh, let me say also, you have, um, I just, we passed out ahead of time the, the card uh, where I list some of the spiritual disciplines that I do in the Bible. So you had this. And this also can enable you to get, uh, you can download the chapter that I just read from for free uh, if you scan that. Um, and I have some handouts in the back on how to do Midrash. Uh, but I thought what we do um, is I can read from a pas passage, and if you can take out something to journal with or even just turn over um, one of the handouts if you happen to get one. Just going to tell you a little bit about um, how Midrash works. So Midrash is the um, ancient practice in the Jewish tradition, and Midrash helps you explore the gaps in the story. It helps you fill in the missing voices, the silences, the wondering that is sparked. You look for places where the, the story kind of stirs your curiosity and stirs up your energy, stirs questions in you. You can question the characters, dialogue. You can be mad at the characters. <laughs> In Midrash, scripture is sometimes uh, described as black fire on white fire. Black fire is the words on the page, and Midrash illuminates the white fire, the spaces in between the words on the page. It's also used in Christianity to some extent. St. Ignatius, the Spanish mystic and Jesuit founder, used a process like this, suggesting that we could have conversations with the characters and that God's uh, wisdom was revealed to us through our imagination and our creativity. So what I'll do, um, I'm going to read uh, a passage from Exodus. First, I'm going to center us. Um, it really helps to get yourself centered first. And then I'm going to read this passage out loud slowly, and I'll guide you through some questions. And if you could take notes on some of your thoughts, you could ignore my questions if you want. I'm just going to read them slowly to kind of prompt you and help you and guide you. Uh, but just write down what comes to mind as you dialogue with the story and you think about the spaces in between the words, the things you'd want to know, the things that touch your life now, whether it's your personal life or the communal life or what you see happening in this nation. So get yourself comfortable and breathe deeply. Let's just center ourselves for a minute. Breathe in and breathe out. So often our minds are racing. They're racing to what we're going to go to next. They're racing forward into the future about anxieties that we might have. Just try to be here. It's so easy to be here. Give yourself the gift of being present in this moment. Just a few minutes to breathe in, breathe out, check in with your body. <sighs> Acknowledge this special moment that we're in to take in wisdom and really give it to yourself. I'm going to read from the chapter of Exodus, very first chapter. We 
which I had handy on my phone, but <laughs> disappeared for a moment. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 to 18. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? Have a conversation with the lead characters. How did they feel? What were they thinking? Do they have any wisdom for you on your journey? Pay attention to the parts of the story which stir the most curiosity or energy for you. What questions arise? Why does this resonate or provoke you? Write down your response in prose or poetry. Do not try to be perfect. Just stay with your insights and feelings. You can write it in a poem or in phrases, keywords. What is God saying to you through this story? What are some of the details you want to imagine and add to the story with? Where do you find energy? What, what's resonating in your heart? What would you say to Shipra and Pua or to Pharaoh or the families of those boys? Keep writing. I'm going to read the text again slowly in case anybody's wanting to hear it again. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you're helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. The king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? I'd love if a few people want to share some of what they're doing. Um, this is a text you can kind of sit with uh, the time you're here. Um, I keep finding as I go back and read the midrashas that I worked on for the book, or as I meet with small groups and speak to people, they'll ask me questions about the story and why I put it the way, put it the way I did. And I realize that those stories the, that I wrote are still speaking to me and they're still revealing things about myself um, that I didn't know in that moment. One was a story about the Queen of Sheba and somebody asked me about how I deal with power in terms of the work that I do uh, and it's corruption. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. That's what's in here and that's what I was grappling with in the moment, but I didn't even see it until I was asked that question. So it kind of shows how Scripture is alive, it's alive in this moment speaking to you, but also your midrash will probably continue to speak to you as well. Would anyone like to share even sort of like images or questions or thoughts that they came up with? What a rich moment. So I wrote down what I called Shipra's song. A man's voice from the outside presses a blade's edge to our back, but we will die before we'll kill. The tiny orb of thought and hope and legacy slips womb wet slick and trusting itself to our hands, hands that made promises to a million women. Our men wait on the outside. The women slip one generation through the last into our promised hands. Pua, let us leave the men on the outside. 
We will die before we will kill. Beautiful. Look at that. She read a song. <laughs> Somebody else. You don't have to have written a whole song. <laughs> yeah. Someone who is an English person, a uh, trained person, is a haiku 557 or is it 575? 575. Well, I forgot that, so mine's 557. <laughs> Pua, so perplexed, leaned into life. How can we honor our God? Pua pondered, turned away fear, will protect all infants. I love it. Thank you. Applause. Wow, I love the alliteration in that too. Pua, so perplexed. Right? Well, I don't have the literary skill that, that many of you do, so I don't have a poem or, or haiku or anything that brilliant. But when I read this, what hit me is um, if I were to rewrite this, this would be the powerful in America saying to um, those of us who have the ability. Um, that what we must do to black men in America is to incarcerate them and to kill them. And we have, as the midwives, the opportunity to do something about that. We need to be Shipra and Pua, and we need to say no. Yeah, that's a good question. I thought about reading the whole chapter, but in, in, in light of time, I didn't. So, so they basically use humor and cleverness to disrupt pharaoh and so they they say look you know the women are just so robust they push the children out before we can even get there and pharaoh like buys it right and so they get away and then they're blessed with numerous children themselves and then the rest of this chapter um, is interesting in that you then see miriam and moses mother step in to save moses and you also see a collaboration with pharaoh's daughter in the chapter so what I began thinking about was how early in the Bible you see a cross-race, cross-class, multi-religious coalition of women resisting an autocratic tyrant, a genocidal tyrant. And I thought of the Stacey Abrams coalition in Georgia and uh, how black women are leading the way and how we need to form these cross-class, cross-race, multi-faith alliances in order to resist tyrants. So the spiritual discipline that I came away from this book and from this chapter is the spiritual discipline of building broad-based coalitions. It's a strategy right there in the Bible. And the whole first chapter of Exodus tells the story of these powerful women. Women often lead the way, especially women of color. And it's not until chapter 2 that we hear from God. And then God walks onto the stage and says, Behold, I am the God who hears the groans of those who are oppressed. And that theme carries throughout the Bible. Really, really beautiful. Any other questions? Because I see we need to wrap in the last four minutes, but yeah. My question is, um, so I'm, I'm naturally inclined to this what you're doing, you know, uh, to do the Midrash. The challenge that I, one challenge I face is I have a, a mentor of sorts who uh, he just has a really high standard. So like for recently, governor in Mississippi said something terrible like, because we believe in eternal life, we're not so scared of people dying in the pandemic. And so I responded to that by uh, posting something. I posted an excerpt from Ezekiel 34, which has a bit about the, the, the bad shepherds who, who talk about how great they're going to be for the sheep, but they actually you know, eat the fat and they, you know, they're, 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 they're really exploited. So I compared Governor Reed to that. And this mentor of mine was like, I don't think that's what Ezekiel was talking about. So the, I guess my question for you is, yeah. how do you, what is your ethic for how to responsibly do this kind of interaction? Yeah. Well, one of the things, as I understand it in the Jewish community, they debate and argue and discuss Midrash, right? It's like a creative, dynamic process. And I think we should do that as a community, too. And we should do it even in public life. 
Because right now there's been a one-sided debate. It's all been the Christian right, right? They have this huge megaphone. And we've been a bit shy about using our, our ethical public voice and our biblical voice. Um, remember when Jeff Sessions um, tried to push back on the religious community, we've been criticizing him for the zero tolerance policy, right? And he stood up at a conference of law enforcement officials and he used Romans 13 to basically tell religious people they should shut up and they should obey the authorities, right? Remember that? And we threw down and we had this loud battle, right, over him about what Romans 13 meant, about the origins of that use of Romans 13 and slavery to justify slavery, and then reinterpreting that whole passage to help people understand that what Romans was about is the higher law of love, that every, every civil law must subscribe to God's love and to dignity. That was an example of that, and we could have and that was a debate, right? Jeff Sessions was saying, here's what Romans 13 means, and we were fighting back. And so there's going to be dispute. I think we need to also like model that posture of being able to stand in our truth, but also um, be willing to hear and dialogue respectfully with others. And that's, that's where the spirit moves, right, is in that discussion. Um, and it's never going to be perfect. But we need to throw down and have that debate and speak our truth. Thank you for the question. I, I like that question a lot, and I, I think whenever we hear metaphor, we make what we can of it ourselves based on our own experience mm -hmm. and thoughts. And so I don't think it's a right or wrong issue. Yeah, it's not a right or wrong because the scripture is alive, and God is really speaking to us through these things. And so we're going to hear it from our own experience, and we want to shape it together in community and hold each other accountable. And yeah, you know, some, some things you know, may go off the wall or whatever, but you, you really discuss and hold each other accountable and wrestle. And that's the beauty of the text, yeah, in claiming it. Now five minutes? Okay. <laughs> Other questions? We have five minutes left. As you're thinking of questions, um, there's a bookmark. There's more materials on this um, which table? Maybe they were moved. Oh, yeah, on the back table by the water cooler. And there's a sample of the book. The book will be in the bookstore today at, um, after 2. It'll be there. And um, you can get a free copy of Chapter 2, the, the Genesis chapter, if you scan that little label there. And I'm willing to come and speak to small groups, church groups. I've been doing that by Zoom and interact with some of the study groups. Um, I also have a newsletter you can sign up for when you get that free chapter. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Yes, Lectio Divino. They're very similar. To me, they are. Um, and I, I talk about in the intro to the book about Lectio Divino, which is, of course, um, you read the scripture and you look at what words and phrases pop out to you. You read it a couple of times, right, meditatively and slowly and see how God is speaking. It's very similar. I think the one difference might be that Midrash, you kind of extrapolate a bit, um, but it's very, very similar. So thank you. Yeah, and I think um, it's funny. I wasn't taught to read scripture that way growing up, and even when I you know, got in more progressive circles, it was always from the head, and less from that sort of mystical, spiritual, meditative sort of standpoint. Um, and I'm realizing now that that is a place to ground myself in these times as we really try to struggle with white supremacy and authoritarianism and Christian nationalism and figure out what God would have us do at this moment in history. It's very important and very important for our personal lives as well. Thank you all so much for being here and uh, happy to stick around and chat.